In this screencast, we are going to discuss the sequence diagram and common sequences used in clinical MRI imaging. At the end of this screencast, you should be able to identify and label the components of a sequence diagram, and describe some of the fundamental differences between the sequences we use every day. The two basic sequences are spin echo and gradient echo. With spin echo, we generate transverse magnetization using a 90 degree pulse, and then we refocus our echo using a 180 degree pulse. Gradient echo is slightly different in that it uses a variable flip angle, depending on the sequence that you're trying to create, that is less than 90 degrees. And instead of using a 180 degree pulse, you use gradient switching to generate your echo. Let's look at a spin echo sequence diagram. So the various lines in this diagram represent both our radio frequency pulses and the gradients we are using to generate our image. We can see that first line is labeled RF and that represents our radio frequency pulse. For a spin echo sequence you will always see a 90 degree pulse that occurs at the same time that the slice select gradient is turned on. The slice select gradient is represented by that first line that will be active during the 90 degree pulse. The 180 degree pulse follows the 90 degree pulse and that 180 degree pulse occurs at 1 half TE and the slice select gradient will also be on for your 180 degree pulse. Your t at your time to echo, you or your TE, you, that is the time at which you will be receiving your signal. And while you are receiving your signal, your frequency encoded gradient will be turned on. Your phase encoded gradient is variable depending on which line of case space you're filling. And so this is a representation of a variable phase encoded gradient. So to review, we have our frequency radio frequency pulse line, our slice select gradient, our frequency encoded gradient, and our phase encoded gradient. When we look at our gradient echo sequence diagram, we see some differences. So along the radio frequency line, we see what is here labeled as an alpha pulse. That alpha pulse is going to be something less than 90 degrees. We see that there is no 180 degree pulse between that alpha pulse and when you receive your signal. That is because the echo is actually going to be generated through gradient switching. You can see here your frequency encoded gradient is reversed immediately before you start to receive your signal. We still do have the slice select gradient which has to be activated during your initial radio frequency pulse and we still have a variable phase encoded gradient depending on which line of case space you're filling. On the slice select gradient you can have a spoiler gradient and that's why we sometimes refer to this as spoiled gradient echo imaging and that spoiler gradient eliminates all residual transverse magnetization before you send your next alpha pulse. To review the spin echo sequence is going to use that 180 degree pulse to refocus your echo and that decreases the amount of signal loss by T2 star effects and therefore spin echo sequences have less artifacts and less signal loss related to magnetic field inhomogeneity. The spin echo sequences in general require longer acquisition times but they generate high signal with less artifacts. The gradient echo sequences, uh, because they do not require multiple RF pulses, can have very short TRs and very short TEs. But since they don't have the 180 degree pulse that eliminates the T2 star effects, you do get rapid dephasing and greater susceptibility to magnetic field inhomogeneities. An important variant of one of the primary sequences we use is the multi-spin, comma fast spin or turbo spin echo sequence. 
with a turbo spin echo sequence we will still have a radio frequency line and an initial 90 degree excitation pulse that occurs while our slice select gradient is on but instead of having one 180 degree refocusing pulse at one half TE generating one echo we now have one two three four 180 degree pulses that occur in what we call an echo train and the number of 180 degree pulses that we use is called our echo train length each of these 180 degree pulses will occur while our slice select gradient is on and they will each generate an echo notice that each of these echoes is created after being subject to a variable phase encoded gradient and by varying the phase encoded gradient between echoes we are able to fill multiple lines of k space with a single 90 degree pulse another thing to note is that the frequency encoded gradient will always be turned on while we are receiving our signal and the frequency encoded gradient is similar for each time that we are receiving our echo. Another important modification that we can make to the spin echo sequence is what we call inversion recovery. We're often doing an inversion recovery spin echo sequence to suppress the signal from a certain type of tissue. So with stir, we're doing that to suppress fat, and with flare, we're doing it to suppress CSF. This is a little bit of a different style sequence diagram, but it nicely demonstrates the inversion recovery structure. So when you're trying to identify a rever inversion recovery sequence based on its sequence diagram, you're gonna to wanna to look at that RF frequency line, and you'll see that a 180 degree pulse will actually precede your 90 degree excitation pulse and the time between that 180 degree pulse and the 90 degree pulse is called your TI or your time to inversion and we'll get a little bit more into the physics of inversion recovery later but essentially you're using this 180 degree pulse to suppress tissue by selecting a time at which there is no longitudinal magnetization of a tissue when you generate your 90 degree excitation pulse. The rest of the sequence diagram will be very similar to the sequence diagram we saw for a spin echo where you have your slice select gradient turned on during each of your excitations. You have your frequency encoded gradient turned on while you're reading out your echo, and you have a variable phase encoded gradient. There are multiple other pulse sequences, and I recommend that you be familiar with those other pulse sequences, but they're a little bit beyond the scope of what we can address in this screencast. One type of imaging is echo planar imaging. With echo planar imaging, you are actually varying your phase encoded gradient uh, in a more continuous way, allowing you to achieve faster acquisition times. And diffusion weighted imaging is a common type of imaging where we're using echo planar imaging. Steady state free procession imaging is a type of gradient echo imaging in which we don't spoil the transverse magnetization, but we achieve a balance in our transverse magnetization and that results in very rapid acquisition capabilities the signal becomes dependent not on T1 or T2 but a ratio of T2 to T1 steady state free procession imaging is very nice for cine imaging and it's also very nice and commonly used for cardiac imaging a final type of imaging is time of flight imaging which you're most frequently going to counter in head and neck MRA and MRV imaging 
And again, that's beyond the scope of this, but I do recommend that you familiarize yourself with these basic sequences and how they function. In summary, we have two basic sequence types. The spin echo sequence, where you use a 90 degree excitation pulse and then create your echo through a 180 degree refocusing pulse. This 180 degree refocusing pulse decreases your signal loss from T2 star effects and results in very high signal images. Gradient echo imaging uses a flip angle of less than 90 degrees and then refocuses your echo using gradient switching. This does not eliminate T2 star effects and therefore you have higher incidence of artifacts, particularly related to metal or gas, but any magnetic field inhomogeneity. The benefit of the gradient echo sequence is that you can have very rapid acquisition.